Okay class, today we are going to continue with chapter 3 and we're going to start section 3 today and we're going to talk about these theorems. We're going to talk about the factor theorem, the rational zeros theorem, number of zeros, conjugate zeros theorem, finding zeros of a polynomial function, and then we're going to talk about uh, Descartes' rule of signs. Okay, so the factor theorem. So like we talked about before, we can use the fact that um, if the remainder is zero, for example, f of k for some k values equal to zero, then we can use the factor theorem to say that, hey, we know from the remainder theorem that if x minus k, if k is a zero, then um, the remainder is going to be zero, right? And so that means f of k would equal zero, right? Because of the remainder theorem. So it's one step further. It's not a large leap to say that, hey, well, if we already know that k is a factor and we're looking at the binomial being divided by a binomial of the form x minus k, then obviously we could write it as a factor using the division algorithm. So this all is connected. Okay. So the factor theorem basically says that, hey, for any polynomial f of x, x minus k is a factor if and only if f of k is equal to zero, which makes sense, right? So, and this is a definition, right? This is an if and only if, so that means that, hey, it goes both ways, okay? So, if f of k is zero, then x minus k is a factor. If x minus k is a factor, then f of k must equal zero. Now, in this example here, determine whether x minus 1 is a factor of each polynomial. Well, guess what? We're going to use synthetic division. We're going to use the remainder theorem because the remainder theorem says that if the remainder is 0, then f of x is equal to 0, and then it has to be a factor by the factor theorem. Okay? So we're going to find whether f of 1 is equal to 0. Okay? Uh, let's see here. Let's see what we get. Okay, so now we got our zero. Remember, we got to skip in a place here, so hold. Okay, sorry about that. So here's the polynomial, so we're going to use synthetic division. So here's our coefficients. Here's our value from our x minus 1, so k is 1. Okay. So now we're going to use synthetic division, and we find that the remainder is 7. Okay, so f of 1 equals 7, not 0. So since the remainder is not 0, x minus 1 is not a factor. Okay, Okay. now what about this one? Okay, well, is this one going to be a factor? Well, let's see here. One way, uh, this is a special case, by the way, and I don't know if it's going to come up or not, but one of the ways to find out whether 1 or negative 1 is a factor. If 1 is a factor, all you have to do is add up the coefficients. If the coefficients add up to 0, x minus 1 is a factor. If they don't add up to 0, then it's not a factor. That's for positive 1. To test for negative 1, if, if you want to test for k equal to negative 1, then you would take the odd powers, all of the coefficients of the odd powers, and change the sign. And if then, after you do that, you add up all of the coefficients, and those coefficients add up to zero, then negative one is a, is a zero, which means x plus one is a factor. Okay? So again, those are two little tricks um, that you can use to see. But again, if it says if, if it says use synthetic division, then again, please use synthetic division, okay? But the, the trick for plus minus one, I use all the time, especially if you're just trying to figure out zeros of a polynomial, okay? Which we'll get to. <coughs> okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to find 
out if 1 is a factor of this one. Now, if we add up these coefficients, this gives us 1, and this gives us 2, this is negative 6, and this gives us negative 1, and then this gives us 0. So these coefficients do add up to 0, so the answer would be yes. Well, let's do synthetic division. Okay, and sure enough, you do synthetic division, and it becomes 0, so f of 1 is equal to 0, which means x minus 1 is a factor by the factor theorem. Okay. Uh, okay, and also, by the coefficients of the bottom row here, the other factor, remember, factors are things we multiply together, so if x minus 1 is one factor, then the other factor is the coefficients for this one, which is one degree lower. So this was a fifth degree. All of these coefficients go with a fourth degree. So it starts with the highest degree and goes down by one, okay? And so f of x can be written as x minus one times this polynomial. And then, of course, if we want to factor out this one, into linear factors, well, one of the things we can do is we can use the factor theorem to find factors, okay? So we're going to test, see if negative 3 is a 0. So if, if this is what we want to look for, then we're going to use this as what we're going to divide by using synthetic division. So in other words, we want to find if x plus 3 is a factor because remember it's x minus k so the factor is going to be x plus 3 if this turns out to be a 0 so again we're gonna use synthetic division so here's negative 3 here are the coefficients okay and we do synthetic division and we find that indeed negative 3 is a 0 which means x plus 3 is a factor Okay, and so we use these three numbers for the coefficients of the other factor. So in this case, it'd be 6x squared plus x minus 1, which is, again, one more uh, degree lower than what we started with. Okay, so now what about this one? Now we want to factor, it says factor the following into linear factors if negative 3 is a zero of this one. Okay, so see what we're doing here. Okay, we're doing the same thing. Negative three. Okay, so we're going to use these. Okay, now, here's what we did, right? So here's the first step. Okay, so the first step was we did negative three, right? And we divided this and we got this one. Okay, now we know that this is a factor, but now we have this one. We're, let's see if we're going to do the same thing. We're going to factor this one. Now here, because it's a square, this is a quadratic, we already have tools in our toolbox. So we don't have to use the factor theorem again. And in fact, if you get down to cubic here, we could have actually fa factored this one by using grouping. Okay, factor by grouping. Okay, but it doesn't always work. Okay, and if factor by grouping doesn't work, then we have to use the factor theorem. And in this case here, it does not work. Okay, so factor by grouping does not work in this case. No, no, it doesn't. So we would have to be down here, and then here we can factor by using the AC method or method of decomposition, and we can factor it into these groups. So now we have uh, factors, linear factors, all of them. And we're done. We can't factor any of these out any further, so we are finished. Okay, now, what about the rational zeros theorem? Now, the rational zeros, zeros theorem is a very important theorem to help us find possible rational roots. Because it's not always the case that we're going to know what to try. Okay? Now, it says, if P divided by Q is a rational number written in lowest terms, and if p divided by q is a zero of f, a polynomial function with integer coefficients, okay, 
So, and if this ratio is a zero of f, which is a polynomial function with integer coefficients, then p has to be a factor of the constant term, and q has to be a factor of the leading coefficient. Okay, so again, if this is true, if we, if this is, this is a rational number written in the lowest terms, and this rational number is a zero of f, which is a polynomial with integer coefficients, then it must be the case that p is a factor of the constant term, so the numerator is a factor of the constant term, and q is a factor of the leading coefficient. So, in other words, here we have, okay, so let's say p, f of p divided by q is equal to zero, so it's a zero, right? And since p, q is a zero of f of x, we know that if we plug in p divided by q for each x value, all the way down to the last one, is equal to zero, right? That's just a, the, just, that's just from this, right? That's a consequence of this, okay? Now, we use our properties of exponents, and we can rewrite it in this way, okay? Right? Okay, so now, so we've got all of these p's divided by q's, right? So now, now what we can do is rewrite it by get, multiplying by q of n, right? So if we multiply everything by q of n, now we get a n p to the n all the way to p n minus 1 times q all the way to what? This, which is equal to, again, now again, they, they put this over here, you don't have to, uh, negative a sub 0 q to the n, okay? So we subtract. So this is equal to this, okay? So now, what do we do? Now we can factor out a p because we have a com we have a common um, factor, so we can factor out a p. Okay, and now what? This result shows that negative a zero q to the n equals the product of the two factors p and this sum. Now for this reason, p must be a factor of this. Okay? Since it was assumed that p over q is written in lowest terms, p and q have no common factors other than 1. So p is not a factor of q to the n. Okay? And if it's not factor of q to the n, right, by deduction, it has to be a factor of what? The constant term. Okay? And in a similar way, it can be shown that q has to be a factor of a to the n, which is the coefficient of the leading term. Okay? So now, consider the polynomial function here. Okay, so now we're going to use this backwards, right? So now it says that if you have, so what does the theorem say? It says if you have p divided by q in lowest terms and p divided by q is a zero of a polynomial with integer coefficients, then it, p must be a factor of the constant term and q must be a factor of the leading coefficient. Now, if we go the other way, it's not necessarily true. But it gives us a list of possibilities, right? So we can go the other way. Now, that doesn't guarantee that the factors of one divided by the other are automatically going to be zeros, but they could be zeros. So it gives us a list of ones that we could choose to use in using the factor theorem. Okay, so 
what are we going to do? Well, the first thing is list all possible rational zeros. Okay, so for a rational number to be 0, P must be a factor of 2, and Q must be a factor of 6. Thus, P can be any of either plus or minus 1 or plus or minus 2. And Q can be any one of plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, plus or minus 3, or plus or minus 6. So these are all of the possible factors of 6, and these are the possible factors of of 2. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to take all of the possible ratios of P divided by Q. So if we take all of the P values, <coughs> which is these, and divide them by each one of these, we get all of these. And of course there could be repeats, but we get rid of the repeats, right? We don't need duplicates. So these are all of the distinct rational numbers that could be possible roots or zeros. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to find all the rational zeros and factor f of x into linear factors. Okay, so here are the, here are the possible rational roots. Now we're going to basically use these to try to factor this polynomial. So of course, let's try one, positive uh, plus or minus 1 first, and then work our way down, okay? So, of course, 1, okay, and it is. So that means we found that x minus 1 is a factor, and this is the other factor. So this is the one we're going to use next in our division, right? And so now we can write f of x as this. Now we're going to do the same thing, but with this one. And so now we're going to use negative 2. Now here's the thing. There's no reason we could have jumped to 2 or negative 2. We could have tried 1 again. Right? It could, have been, it could be another root. There could be a repeated root. Right? So we could have tried 1 again and see if it worked. And, or we could have tried negative 1. Okay? So I always try the same root until it doesn't work anymore. Okay? So now what I would do is I would try ne uh, 1 again to see if it works. But if you look at the coefficients, this will not add up to 0. So 1 will not work. Uh, if you do negative 1, um, it doesn't work as well. Okay. So now let's use negative 2. So they use negative 2 and of course it works. So that means x plus 2 is a factor. So now we got two factors. We got x minus 1 and x plus 2. Okay. And the other factor now that we're looking at is this one, which is again one more degree less. Right. So we started with 4, then it went to 3, now we're down to 2. And now at this point, we don't need to use the uh, theorem anymore. We can use everything else that we have in our toolbox to factor this thing. Okay, so now we've, here are the two factors we got using the rational zeros theorem and the factor theorem. And so now we can use the quadratic using our toolbox. We can factor this quadratic into these two. Okay, and so now we've got four linear factors four zeros. And so setting each one of those equal to zero by using the uh, zero product principle, we know either this is equal to zero, or this is equal to zero, or this is equal to zero, or this is equal to zero. So we're going to set each one of those equal to zero and solve for x for each one of those. And so we find that the zeros are one third, negative one half, one, and negative 2. Okay? And so now we know how to factor this completely. This is completely factored. And we can check this by multiplying all the factors together and see if we get the same uh, polynomial back. So always at least check at least one time to make sure that you're doing it correctly. Okay, so note in example 3, once we obtained
the quadratic expression, right? The quadratic factor here. We were able to complete the work by factoring it directly, okay? Had it not been easily factored, we could have used the quadratic formula to find the other two zeros as well, okay? Again, we have other tools in our toolbox to handle quadratic expressions, right? Quadratic polynomials. Also, the rational zeros theorem gives only possible rational zeros. It does not tell us whether these rational zeros are actual zeros, okay? We must rely on the other methods to determine that, okay? For example, the factor theorem and the um, remainder theorem, okay? Now, furthermore, the function must have integer coefficients. If they don't have integer coefficients, this does not work, okay? So to apply the rational zeros theorem, to a polynomial with fractional coefficients, we must multiply through by the least common denominator so that all of the coefficients become integers, okay? So for example, in this case here, we would multiply everything by six, because if we multiply everything by six, all of the coefficients will become integers. This will become six, this will become 2 or minus 2. This will become what? Two, uh, 4. This will become minus 2. And this will become, or excuse me, I'm sorry. This will become uh, minus 1. And this will become uh, minus 2. Okay, and so here's what we get. So now this would be the polynomial that we would work with. Now, the fundamental theorem of algebra. The fundamental theorem of algebra says that every function defined by a polynomial of degree one or more has at least one complex zero. Okay, let me repeat that. Every function defined by a polynomial of degree one or more has at least one complex zero. Okay, so now from the fundamental theorem of algebra, if f of x is of degree one or more, then there is some k1 such that k1, f of k1 equals zero. That's what the factor, that's what the fundamental theorem is saying. There has to be, if it's a degree of one or more, there has to be at least one k value where the function is equal to zero. Okay? By the factor theorem, we know that this has to be written as x minus k1 times some quotient, q sub 1 of x. Okay? Some polynomial. Now, then, of course, if q1 of x is of degree 1 or more, then the fundamental theorem says that, again, by the fundamental theorem and the factor theorem, can be used to factor q1 of x in the same way. There is then some k2, such that k1 of, or excuse me, q sub 1 of k sub 2 is equal to 0. And so we get this. So q1 is equal to this times q2 sub 2 of x, okay, where... Now, this is equal to this, right? So now we could substitute in this, and f of x becomes x minus k sub 1 times x minus k sub 2 times q2 of x1. And so what? We can keep doing this over and over again, right? So if we're assuming that f of x has a degree n and repeating this process n times, we get f of x is equal to a times x minus k1 times x minus k2 all the way to x minus k sub n, where a is the leading coefficient of f of x. So each of these factors leads to a zero of f of x. So f of x has the same n zeros k1 through k sub n. And so the result suggests the number of zeros theorem. So the number of zeros theorem says this. A function defined by a polynomial of degree n 
has at most n distinct zeros. Okay, so it will have at most n distinct zeros. Why distinct? Because there could be repeated zeros in here. Okay, so it could. That's why it says at most. Okay, distinct zeros. So now, find a polynomial f of x of degree 3 with the real coefficients that satisfy the given condition. So now, they're giving us the zeros. Okay, we know it's a degree 3, which means we're going to have, at most, three distinct zeros. Well, look at that. We got three distinct zeros. So these must be all of the zeros for f of x. So guess what? Now we know that what? K plus, excuse me, x plus 1 is a factor, x minus 2 is a factor, and x minus 4 must be a factor. So let's deal with that first, and we'll deal with this last. Okay, and so that's what I just said. So now we know that this polynomial f of x with degree 3 must have this form, right? Where a is some real number, right? We just don't know what it is. But it has to have these three factors, as I just said. So now what we're going to do is we are going to expand this out and see what we get. So by using the FOIL method or the, the distributive property twice, we're going to figure out what this polynomial looks like. And of course, we'll have A at the, at the front. Okay. So, but we'll, we'll use this in a minute. So we're going to use F of 1 is equal to 3. Can we use that? Yeah. So what we could do is we could use this f of 1 is equal to 3 and solve for a. Okay. So f of 1 equals 3. All we're going to do is plug in 1 and set that thing equal to 0. Or excuse me, set it equal to 3 and then solve for a. So we know that f of 1, which is 3, is equal to this. Right. So all we have to do is then simplify. Okay. And so in this case here, we get 3 equals 6a. Or a equals one half, and so now we know what a is. A is equal to one half. Okay, so now, thus, we have f of x equals one half times the three factors. Okay, and so by multiplying through and uh, using the distributive property and simplifying everything by adding like terms, we get f of x is equal to this polynomial function. Okay? And we're done. Now it says here, find a polynomial of degree 3 with real coefficients that satisfy the given condition. So here now we have this. We have negative 2 is a 0. And it has a multiplicity of 3. Well, what does the multiplicity of 3 mean? It means that it comes up as a factor or it comes up as a zero three times. So this is a repeated root. Okay? This means that if this is a zero, x plus two is a factor. And since it has a multiplicity of three, there are three factors that are exactly the same. So x plus two comes up three times. Okay? Which means those those have to be all of the factors. There's no other factors involved. Because you can only have three because it's a degrees 3. Now we're also going to use this to solve for a, right? Now, so here's our function, so written in factored form. So a times x plus 1, or excuse me, x plus 2 times x plus 2 times x plus 2, okay? Using the factor theorem. Now we know that f of negative 1 equals 4, so we know that we're just going to plug in negative 1 for all the x values, and that has to equal negative 4. Okay, so here we go. We simplify it. Okay. And so now we have this equal to negative 1. Right? So this is f of negative 1. So x is equal to negative 1. And so we get negative 1 plus 2, which is 1. So we get 1. 1 cubed is 1. So we get a is equal to 4. <coughs> 
Okay. And so then we can rewrite it as a factor. So it's 4 times this. Or if we expand it out, and again, make sure you know how to do this. So expand this out. That's x plus 2 times x plus 2 times x plus 2. And we, if we distribute and simplify, we will get this result. Now, in the first example, 4a, we cannot clear the denominators in f of x by multiplying each side by 2 because the result would equal 2 times f of x, not f of x. So you have to be careful that if you in some cases, like in this case, you cannot get rid of the fractional exponents, okay, because you don't know what f of x is. If f of x is equal to 0, that's one thing, okay. Okay, so here we go. Properties of conjugates. Okay, it says for any complex number, C and D, the following properties hold. Now, this bar is for conjugate. Okay, so the conjugate of C plus D is equal to the sum of its conjugates. So the conjugate of a sum is equal to the sum of its conjugates. Okay, the conjugate of a sum. Of complex numbers is equal to the conjugate, or excuse me, the sum of the conjugates. Uh, here, this is multiplication. They, the symbol didn't come through right. So the product, the conjugate of the product, is equal to the product of the conjugates. And here, you can bring the conjugate into the power. So the conjugate of a complex number raised to a power is equal to the the conjugate of the complex number raised to that power. So you can bring the conjugate inside the power. Okay. So if now, so that brings up to the conjugate zeros theorem. If f of x defines a polynomial function having only real coefficients. Okay. Before we talk about um, integer coefficients, but now we're going to say real coefficients, but real coefficients include integer coefficients too. So, and if z, which is a complex number, is a zero of f of x, where a and b are real numbers, then the conjugate of z, which is equal to this, right, it's always plus and minus, is also a zero of f of x, which brings up the idea of a conjugate pair. Okay, <clears throat> so here's the proof of the conjugate there, zeros theorem. Okay, so here's our polynomial function we start with. Okay, all the coefficients are assumed to be zero, uh, real. If the complex z number z is a zero, then we know that if we replace it with z, right, replace x with z, that's equal to zero, right? That just follows from the definition of being a zero. Now, if we take the conjugate of both sides of this equation, we get the conjugate of this, right, zero, and the conjugate of this. Now we're going to use the properties of conjugates. And so we can break this up, right? We can use this, these properties, and we can break this up into the sum of the conjugates and into the product of the conjugates. Okay? Now, guess what? Now we can bring in the conjugate into the power, right? Now we can use this third property, and now we can write it as a to the n, and then z, the conjugate of z to the n, is equal to the conjugate of 0, which is 0. Well, we just proved that z conjugate is also a 0. And there's the proof. Very, very simple, elegant proof showing that both z, if z being a complex number is a zero, then the conjugate of z is also a zero, and that completes the proof. Now, when the conjugate zeros theorem is applied, it is essential that the polynomial have only real coefficients. Okay, for example, 
this has 1 plus i as a 0. But the conjugate 1 minus i is not a 0 because look at this. This is not a real coefficient. Okay? It's a complex coefficient. Okay. Now here, now here's the, the example. Find a polynomial function f of x of at least of least degree. Okay, we want the smallest degree. Okay? So find f of x of least degree having only real coefficients and having the zeros 3 and 2 plus i. Now, what's the first thing you should know? Well, what's the smallest degree that you have to have? Well, in this case here, we've got 1, 2 zeros, but are those the only zeros? And the answer is no, because this is a complex number, which means if this is a zero, its conjugate must be zero, so 2 minus i also is a zero. So the degree is, the minimum degree is going to be 3. Okay, so now we have three zeros. 3, 2 plus i, 2 minus i. Now we're going to use the factor theorem, and we know that we can write these as x minus 3 as one factor, x minus this as another factor, and then x minus this as the third factor. So don't forget that. These are zeros, so it's always going to be of the form x minus k, and this is your k value, this whole thing. So it's going to be x minus this entire thing, and x minus this entire zero, okay? And then you're going to write it as a in factored form. So this would be the way you would have to write it. And then what you need to do is then simplify these parentheses and then start using the distributive property okay and so now remember i squared is negative one so when you start to use the distributive property here to expand these out use this to simplify things and so you get the quadratic x squared minus 4x plus 5 times x plus 3 and now we're going to use the distributive property again to get our final answer. And so this is our final answer. And so f of x equals this polynomial. Now, here it says find the degree, find a polynomial function of degree. <clears throat> now here, we're going to continue on. Oops. So here we want to find a polynomial function of least degree, having only real coefficients again, and we want the zeros 3 and 2 plus i. And since this is a complex number, complex 0, its conjugate is also going to be a 0, which means 2 minus i is a 0. So again, remember, just be careful once you get the zeros. So any non-zero multiple of this also satisfies this condition, right? So we can't forget that we can multiply this by any non-zero number. Okay, a. Remember the a, the leading coefficient. So oh, hold on. So what we would do is we would assume that a is 1 or we would multiply this by 1. So the information on the zeros given in this problem is not sufficient to give a specific value for what the leading coefficient would be. Okay? So again, if I say, if we, it, it, the problem will either, either say assume A is 1 or you'll just have to give this and then that would be the best you can do. Or just multiply it by, the whole thing by A and just leave it that way. But again, you'll know in the homework problem or on the exam. Now, in this example, it says find all zeros of this function, okay, given that 1 minus i is a zero. Okay, now immediately you also know another zero, which is 1 plus i, because of the conjugate zeros, right, conjugate zeros. 
conjugate pairs, okay? And so we know that the factors x minus 1 minus i and x minus um, x, excuse me, uh, x minus uh, 1 plus i are both factors, okay? So what that means is that we could use synthetic division to divide the original polynomial by this. Okay, so we would use 1 minus i in our synthetic division. Okay, and we can find what the quotient would be. So again, this is what we would put in, and we would use the synthetic division algorithm the exact same way as we would with a real number. Okay. And so we drop down, we multiply, we get this here, we add down, then we multiply again, right? And again, make sure you simplify whenever necessary, whenever possible. And what happens? We get a zero, right? Because we already knew that, right? We already knew this was a factor, so it makes sense we get a zero. If we don't get a zero, then we made a mistake somewhere. Because if we know this is a zero, then it has to end up with a remainder of zero. Now, these give us the coefficients of the new quotient, okay? Now, we know that this, right? So we know this and this are factors, right? Just by what we just did. Now we also know that this is also a zero, and so we can use synthetic division and take this quotient here, right here. We could take this quotient and divide by this using synthetic division again. So this time we're going to use i plus 1. And so now we take these coefficients with this zero, and we do the same thing. And now look what we get. We get zero. And now we get these coefficients, and so now we have two factors, and here's our the next quotient that we're going to use. And so now we can put it all together. We know this is one factor, this is another factor, and now here is the last factor. And of course, now we can just factor this directly. Okay, and so we could factor this into uh, two factors by using the AC method. Okay, and so. Here's our factors, <clears throat> okay? And so we got all of the zeros now, okay? So all of the zeros are 2, 3, and then of course 1 minus i and 1 plus i. Now the last section here is the Descartes rule of signs, okay? So this is used to find out what the possible positive roots are and negative roots are as far as how many there are, okay? Now in this case here, it says let f of x define a polynomial function of real coefficients again and a non-zero constant term. So we can't have a zero constant term with terms in descending powers of x. A. The number of positive real zeros of f either equals the number of variations in sign occurring in the coefficients of f of x or less than the number of variations by some positive even integer. Okay, so that's one. Then b says the the number of negative real roots or negative real zeros of f either equals the number of variations in sign occurring in the coefficients of f of negative x. So in other words, you're going to take the um, values, the odd powers, and you're going to change those signs. Okay. Then what you're going to do is you're going to count the number of sign variations. Okay, and so that will equal the number of negative real zeros, or the, or there's going to be less than that number by some positive even integer again. 
So, okay, so now that's a mouthful. Let's apply this so it makes more sense. So, how many positive real roots are there for this polynomial? Well, let's see how many times the sign, the, the sign changes from coefficient to coefficient. So here we start with positive, and it changes to negative. There's one change. Then it goes back to positive. There's a second change. Then it stays positive, so no change. Then it goes back to negative. There's a third change. So it changes three times. So that means that there's either three positive roots or some even positive integer less than that. So that means if I subtract 2, I have 1. If I have subtract 2 again, well, then I go in the negative values, which I don't want. So that means that there are either 3 or 1 positive real roots. Okay? Okay? Now, <clears throat> so that means there are either 3 or 1 positive real roots. Now, for negative roots, we're going to first do f of negative x, which means we're going to take all of the odd powers and we're going to change the signs. So this will stay positive. This will change the positive. This will stay positive. This will change the negative, And this will stay negative. Okay. And now, if we take this, now everything is positive all the way up to here. And then it stays negative. So there's only one, excuse me, one change in sign. Which means that the number of negative roots is going to be 1. Po or negative real roots is going to be 1. And that, that's it. That's all. So, so far we have either 2, excuse me, 3 or 1 positive roots and 1 negative root. Okay. And that's it. Okay, and that's it. So that tells us, oh, and by the way, look at the possible positive and uh, negative roots. If you add three and you add the one, so there has to be one negative root, right? You can't have less than one. So there's one negative root, okay? That means that there has to be what? one or three positive roots. Well, if you add three and one, that gives you four, which equals the degree of the polynomial. So chances are there are three positive roots and one negative root. Okay. Now there may be also complex roots, right? But we'll have to do more. Okay, but again, the the rule of signs only tells you how many positive roots there may be and how many negative roots there may be. Okay? Okay, have a great day. Again, make sure you go through these. Do these on your own. Make sure you understand the theorems. Make sure you understand how to apply them to these examples. Do more examples in the textbook. Do some of the homework problems, the exercises at the end of the chapter. And uh, again, if you get stuck on something, bring them to class. If you have questions, if you're not sure about how I did some of these, bring it to class. That's where we're going to work on it. Okay, have a great day, and I'll see you next time.